it recognizes that sometimes spontaneously we have these openings and you know just the trajectories that occur and the ways that um, the mainstream psychological psychiatric system you know unfortunately can pathologize the experiences um, you know just have the perspective this is a you know a psychotic break or a, a psychological problem or something of that nature um, and so you know transpersonal psychology and the Groff's work really did a lot to, um, you know, create a field and a group of people that, you know, could help people when they're having this kind of emergence, you know, understand it as a normal gift or grace, you know, of spirit and, and, and follow it and integrate it rather than shut it down or, you know, medicate it, which often happened. You know. Welcome to the Mystics Rising Podcast. I'm Jen Riley, and on today's episode, we are going to interview Jay Dufresho. Jay is a PhD in transpersonal psychology, an author of Moving Through Grief and Reconnecting with Nature, and the managing director of the Stan Groff Legacy Project. Uh, he has had an amazing experience of being able to work very closely with Stan Groff, who is the father of transpersonal psychology. And for those of you who are not familiar, transpersonal psychology is really like, how are we transcending the human experience, right? How are we going beyond the world of just thought? And um, one of my favorite parts about Stan is he, you know, really came into this the part of his work around holotropic breath work and holotropic meaning moving towards wholeness. And so um, whether it's through breath work or psychedelics, there's, or just meditation, basically there are lots of different ways that we're experiencing trans, we're, we're having transpersonal experiences or non-ordinary states of being. And all of these states of being are really in an essence supporting our journey of wholeness and awakening. And in this episode, uh, Jay has been a really wonderful support to many people in his journey in the world of spiritual emergency. And so we really talk about spiritual emergency being, you know, a part of our evolution and a part of our, you know, conscious growth and how, it, you know, traditionally it's been really difficult for people who have had not the right kind of mentors in those situations. And it's you know, shamed or um, being prescribed with medication and really there, and, and there's a place for that as well. And there's also a place of just norm, you know, normalizing that spiritual emergency is a part of our evolution. So I'm really excited to share with you Jay and his wisdom and yeah, how we're kind of coming into this spiritual emergence and normalizing, again, my, 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 one of my favorite themes here, but normalizing, healing, normalizing our evolution. So I hope you all enjoy this episode. Make sure to subscribe, um, check the notes for resources, uh, how to get involved with the Stan Groff uh, Legacy Project. They have a really great class. Um, and they offer workshops on holotropic breathwork and psychedelic integration. Um, so feel free to check that out and let me know if you have any questions. Well, welcome, Jay, to the show, to Mystics Rising, um, where we are here, kind of uh, like we were just talking, uh, welcoming in a co-inquiry into the modern day spiritual renaissance and um, yeah, really feeling into what is modern day mysticism. And there's a lot of spiritual awakenings and um, deep healing and uh, Jay out just for all my listeners. Um, Jay has been a teacher of mine who worked really closely with Stan Groff um, in the transpersonal psychology, psychedelic integration, and holotropic breathwork world. And um, yeah, Jay, maybe you want to just 
introduce yourself and, and the work you're doing and um, share a little bit of maybe your spiritual awakening journey and why is this work um, really calling to you? Sure, Jen. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. And I, I love these conversations and I, I really agree. I feel like we're in a time of, of spiritual awakening, uh, spiritual renaissance. And I'm, you know, honored and grateful to have a little, uh, you know, chance to help, help what's arising. So for me personally, I, um, you know, grew up fairly mainstream life background was Catholic. Um, religion didn't have a whole lot of, uh, draw for me, um, went to law school and was working hard as a lawyer, had uh, three children um, living in San Jose, California. And then to get to the, the story of the spiritual awakening, I was invited to work with um, a group of people, just colleagues from work who were um, learning to, to feel energy, so to speak. We had a friend of a friend who had trained as a psychic and would, um, you know, offer people ways to, uh, you know, feel energy of the heart or just feel auras or things of that nature. And I was happy to participate, but honestly, I didn't take it all that seriously. Um, it was fun. You know, I felt some things and then towards the end of our time together, um, the woman who was offering the experience said, I'm going to stand behind Jay and use the Christ energy, which, didn't have a whole lot of meaning to me, but suddenly with whatever happened, I felt filled with what's easiest to describe as white light, which is um, experientially for me, the same as unconditional love. So throughout my body was the sense of unconditional love so deep and so real. I was immediately weeping um, and, you know, knew, you know, as we say in every cell of my body that, love was a basic energy in the universe um and everything changed for me you know in in just a few minutes i mean i i was convinced um that the material world um you know is an outgrowth or a, a projection of consciousness if you will and that love is a more basic energy in the universe and um then there was also part of it a sadness that um, uh, this is not easily felt or understood, you know, and then honestly, even though I said Catholicism didn't have a whole lot of meaning for me with this experience, this were images of the crucifixion of Jesus and, um, an awareness that, or a sense that there had been someone who had been able to embody unconditional love and that the human response was to kill him, <laughs> you know, and then just the grief around that. Um, and around the knowledge that that's part of the human condition, that so many of us react in this way um, to love. And so then, you know, that began, um, that was probably the mid 90s that began, what are we pushing on uh, 30 years of, of unfolding? Um, I went to graduate school in transpersonal psychology at what was then the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology in Palo Alto. And I wasn't looking for a degree so much as a way to understand and integrate what had happened. And um, it wasn't exactly isolated because I would feel like I had access to this energy in other circumstances. And then, you know, without claiming anything, there were also um, just sort of psychic correlates of it. Like I would be with someone and have information that, you know, then I would find out was true. I mean, for instance, the most dramatic, I walked into a house and felt a sense of death. And um, we researched the house and there had been a murder in there a few years before. So again, this, added to my sense that, um, you know, the mainstream materialist view that I'd been raised in and educated in, you know, was not the whole story of, of uh, you know, life in the universe. So, you know, I was fortunate to find ITP and um, exposed to many modalities, um, therapeutic techniques, meditation, 
breath work. Um, the work of Stan Groff certainly was meaningful to me from the very beginning. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that later, but uh, then just followed the trajectory of what was arising. Um, and, uh, you know, here, here I am all these years later, so. Well, you know, it's funny, this concept of unconditional love um, that you're talking about, I find it really fascinating how, how few people really have an embodied experience of unconditional love, how powerful of a healing place it is to just be able to surrender and know like that you're surrounded by unconditional love yeah. and, um, and how needed it is. I think that there's a lot of, I, I said this on one of my other shows, but there's this context of like, oh, my partner can be the only person who can love me unconditionally. And I find that actually relationships are more like romantic relationships are actually more conditional, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> than, right. right? You know, cause yeah. it's like, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily going to choose to be with you if you're, you know, right. going to act a certain way. And, and right. there's this, um, right. you know, you're such a deep yearning in you know, individuals for unconditional love. And when you feel it, it's like, oh my God, like this has to be so special. And, you know, I mean, the question, like, how, how do we normalize more unconditional love and, and realize this access to it? And I find that a lot of the, um, the barrier between this embodiment of unconditional love really comes from our unresolved trauma. Absolutely. That would absolutely be my experience. And when I said that that initial experience and then having access to the modalities I, at ITP began a long story. You know, that was a story of healing and understanding and a, a psychological story, you know, and many people write about this from different perspectives, um, you know, with, with spiritual awakening and the, the challenges that, that come across, you know, including, I mean, inflation, working through trauma, you know, working through anger, you know, and then trying to, to make the life changes that, you know, one is, one feels called to make in order to live more authentically, you know, in line of, of sort of what the discoveries and awakening are, you know, when you're in a culture um, that doesn't necessarily understand or, or honor these types of experiences. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's like a, a long, uh, I want to say forgotten, <laughs> like, yeah, a long, right. <laughs> like a forgetting of these like original universal principles that right yeah yeah I'm, I'm curious and maybe if you want to share um just for the audience uh yeah. what like maybe as a definition for you of transpersonal psychology and um yeah how that's brought um meeting and i want to say like alignment um in yeah. your healing path yeah thank you so um you know, sort of the trajectory of depth psychology, there was Freud, you know, um, I mean, it's, it's funny to talk about these things. And you and I have talked about this in other contexts, because to me, it's more like a remembering of knowledge and practices and wisdom that humans used to have. And it's sort of, you know, felt away from the mainstream, you know, with modern industrial life. So, you know, with, with Freud around 1900, um, you know, discovering, so to speak, the unconscious and that many of our motivations are, are from places we don't understand and looking at that. And then Carl Jung uh, broadening that understanding with the idea of, you know, um, an, an internal wisdom that comes forward in dreams and can be followed. And then the humanistic movement in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, which tried to bring therapy, you know, more, um, to a human person to person situation with Carl Rogers and others, rather than, um, you know, more of the kind of top down psychoanalytic approach of an expert who's going to um, figure something out and tell somebody what the problem is and fix them, so to speak. So humanistic was, um, you know, more uh, person to person, more of an equivalent situation. And then, uh, you know, Abraham Maslow was big in the humanistic movement. He's um, 
you know, wrote about and studied peak experiences, which moves towards um, towards mystical experiences in the sense of being in the flow and you know finding oneself reaching true potential and things of that nature. And um, then several people came together in the, um, the 70s, mostly in Northern California, realizing that um, even humanistic psychology did not bring in access to spiritual traditions. Um, Stan Groff was part of that group, Jim Fadiman, Miles Vich, Sonia Margales, um, and others, and Abe Maslow was um, you know, interested in the beginning. He was um, older than some of these folks, and I believe he had a heart condition that limited some of his work. So they got together and um, came up with the word transpersonal, meaning trans meaning beyond. So beyond the sense of individual egoic sense to a self, to a sense of connection with um, other people, other realms. Um, and so um, schools arose, including the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology. There's a journal, Journal of Transpersonal Psychology and um, conferences. And initially, you know, a, a big part of the movement was to bridge between contemporary psychology and psychiatry and spiritual traditions, particularly the Eastern traditions that were coming into the U.S. in the 60s and 70s, meditation, yoga, all of these things, and to, you know, have a, a field of study and a field of practice that would recognize that um, many of us experience ourselves as more th than just the encapsulated ego, but rather are moving towards um, you know, a development that includes a spiritual trajectory. So the word psycho-spiritual, you know, became a big piece of it in terms of um, sort of just an experiential understanding that for many of us, as we do our psychological work, and then particularly if we're doing practices, again, meditation, yoga, breath work, that seem to open us and heal us, that we naturally move towards what feels like uh, spiritual connection and spiritual understanding. I love that you are a big fan of, of vertical development and it, there is this, you know, evolution of, of ourselves that, you know, constructing the ego and, yeah. and fully dissolving the ego. And, right. and it's like through this dissolving of our constructs that we actually do open. And it's interesting to, I think, have that lens of spiritual connection, living in flow as you're sharing yeah. is really, um, you know, part of the evolution of our being and not, and, and something that I, I really appreciate in Stan's work was, um, you know, the kind of shifting from all, you know, the term altered states of being into non-ordinary states of being, non-ordinary, I think more so speaking to beyond the constructs of the mind and yeah. more into what are these, you know, a, a state of being that is in one, with our you know, spiritual self, you know, with dissolving of those constructs. Yeah. And that they're actually, I find you know, more, more ordinary than non-ordinary. I think that um, there hasn't been enough collective understanding, um, even just bringing it out into the light and sharing, uh, sharing these experiences for people to really recognize and identify when they're in a non-ordinary state versus an ordinary state or, or what does that even yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's well said. I, I mean, and, and part of Stan Groff's work that I think is so helpful is he and his late wife, Christina, developed the concept of spiritual emergence, emergency, mm -hmm. you know, which um, recognizes that sometimes spontaneously we have these openings and, you know, just the trajectories that occur and the ways that um, the mainstream psychological psychiatric system, you know, unfortunately can pathologize the experiences, um, you know, just have the perspective, this is a, you know, a psychotic break or a, a psychological problem or something of that nature. Um, and so, you know, transpersonal psychology and the Groff's work really did a lot to, um, you know, create a field and a group of people that, you know, could help people when they're having this kind of emergence, you know, 
understand it as a normal gift or grace, you know, of spirit and, and, and follow it and integrate it rather than shut it down or, you know, medicate it, which mm. often happened. As you're sharing this, what's coming alive in me is um, like the spiritual emergence is just as normal uh, of an initiation Absolutely. as like a woman getting her period, right? For the yeah. first time. I yeah. mean, like, it's oh, kind of like that whole concept, like, oh my God, what's happening to my body? <laughs> you know, yeah. and I think that there's like a similar kind right. of awakening in the spiritual emergence. And, and maybe it would be helpful again to just um, maybe share your definition of spiritual emergency and, um, and yeah, like what, what I would love for you to yeah, just maybe open up a little bit more and have, have you been, I can't remember if you've been a part of maybe nurturing people in this place. I know that that was a big part of Stan Groff's work. Yeah. It, I mean, informally, I've never had, you know, a, a practice, so to speak, along that, you know, spiritual emergence vein, but um, working in academia prom primarily and certainly as a breathwork facilitator, you know, I, I come into contact with many people who are in what we would call spiritual emergence. Um, and it's, a, you know, my, the experience that I shared at the beginning is a, is a good example. Um, and, you know, many people, uh, you, you know, have physical symptoms. Um, sometimes, you know, we, it, there's a, a lens um, looking at the physical symptoms, which can consider Kundalini arising, you know, with uh, ener energy from the base of the spine or an energetic system working through the body and working with the issues that are in, in different chakras. Um, you know, sudden changes in belief, sudden, you know, sense of um, visitation, even by by spirits, but anything that uh, is a pull towards understanding a relationship with spirit or God or the divine, um, it often coming through the body. You know, even my experience was a lot of what felt like physical sensation. And then part of my draw to breath work, which we're now calling Groff breath work within Groff legacy, is um, that the breath, uh, you know, it can invite a non ordinary state of consciousness, which Dan calls a holotropic state, but the breath moves into different areas of the body and can help, um, you know, release energetic blockages that are there, which then also bring forward the images, emotions, and, you know, part of this healing trajectory. And so the reason Stan and Christina Groff created the phrase spiritual emergence, emergency is a play on words from the emergence of spirit, but then the emergency that can be felt to be created, just like you were talking about, what, what do I do with this? You know, even some of the energetic arising, you know, people would be concerned it's a physical symptom, you know, go to a, a, a mainstream physician who's going to analyze it with the material lens, and then you can get down the road of medication and, and suppression, um, you know, as opposed to the Groff viewpoint, um, you know, which you always want to check out whether that's a physical thing that can be assisted, you know, that's happening that needs treatment of some kind versus an understanding of allow the symptoms to come forward and work with them, integrate them, you know, work with people who can help you understand what's happening, um, you know, as a pull towards you know, a larger understanding, a pull towards spirit, a pull towards the sacred. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, would, I would love to see more normalizing of these spiritual emergencies and embracing them as this initiation into a new level of consciousness in our, in right. our life and, and to be celebrated as, you know, you, you really, deconstructed parts of your ego and created space in your life to allow for this new connection to exist in you i think it, it is hard because so much of our world is you know that we operate in is from this construct of the mind and constructs of ego and it's really yeah. hard for when there's a majority of people who are so entrenched in the constructs of the mind to see that there's anything beyond it. It's like asking my six-year-old daughter to, you know, yeah. do some calculus 
exam you know <laughs> and, and it's and she's so yeah. you know she has no concept of it so she's gonna look at calculus and be like mom you're crazy and i right. think that that, that <laughs> we don't realize that that's a lot of what we're yeah. experiencing in the, the yeah. spiritual emergence and yeah. i love the play on words so much that it's the i was kind of noticing that when you were sharing this emergence that it's emerging Versus through it. us yeah. and unfolding right, right. And it creates a sense of urgency of, of what's happening and how do I help myself? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the biggest challenges I've had, you know, in the last 30 years is how do you even begin to explain this to somebody? <laughs> you know, it's because, <laughs> because the, you know, the, like you're saying, the constructs aren't there or, you know, the, the materialist constructs are so entrenched, um, you know, and then honestly, sometimes people, you know, a certain religious structure has meaning and safety for them. And then those constructs are so entrenched. Um, and, you know, the awakening is not a head thing. You know, it's a, you could say heart-based, body-based, experience-based. And so, you know, you can tell somebody like the experience I described, I had a, I had a sense of unconditional love and that can just be words. But if you have it, you feel it you know, in your, in your body, in your heart, that's an entirely different thing, you know, and that's why I've been so interested in supporting the growth of what we're now calling Roth breath work, because that's a easy experience, a safe experience. There's no drugs involved. Um, and it's not the, the modality that calls to everyone. And for, for many people, it, you know, invites them to begin experiencing um, you know, healing through their body, a sense of an inner healer, a sense of love. Um, and you just can, can see the awakening that comes with people from, from the experience. And then once experiences start, then you can offer framework like transpersonal psychology or Stan Groff's work to help people hold on to it and understand it and move through it, you know, and then have the conversations that they need to have with, with people in their life. But yeah, I, I think now, um, and you know, you could frame this in so many ways, but I, I, I almost think we're in such need on the planet, you know, certainly in humanity and what humanity has done to nature and, and so many other species that, uh, you know, the, my kids like Star Wars, that the force may be with us, <laughs> to, uh, you know, to, to begin opening and to to do the the healing work that that we're called to do and i um i'm not personally an expert in trauma but i really respect the framing that's arising um you know culturally and then in, in psychology just to understand uh the generational trauma um that's exists in the world from all the practices you know imperialism colonialism racism sexism um, heterosexism, all, all of the things that, you know, really live in so many of our bodies. And I, I'm hopeful that we are ready, you know, enough of us are ready to begin finding ways to, to help heal these things, which I think simultaneously go along with an opening to spirit and opening to love, opening to compassion. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate you mentioning this concept of the generational trauma, because I think it's like excuse me we get so wrapped up I know in my own experience it's like get wrapped so tightly around the trauma that I experienced and how that lived in me and it's like well that also lived in my mother that lived in my grandmother that lived in my grandmother's grandmother and and it's like how far back does that go back you know, uh, of people not being able to fully express themselves, of, of needing to suppress emotions, of being too sensitive, of being too this, of being too that. Yeah. And um, it's really, really, really powerful to step in. And um, I, I use this term a lot of like being the oyster of, of the world, <laughs> yeah. the oyster yeah. of our trauma, you know, that we're taking, you know, everything and, you know, healing and bringing forth maybe for the first time you know, for our children or in the future generations, I want to say like a clean palate, not that the palate's ever fully clean, but to even yeah. have any awareness of opening space 
for the next generations to just step into their being and to be able to live from that place is, I think, a really novel. And, and what kind of world could we create when we have a whole generations of children growing up, you know, not worrying about how they're expressing themselves or if they're too much or if they're not enough and they can actually just yeah. fully live into the gifts that they were born into this world with. Yeah, that's beautifully said. I mean, amen to all that. And I, I really feel that's the opportunity we have have now in the calling. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things about working with holotropic states, you know, whether breath work or, or people who, um, you know, find legal psychedelic experiences, which are opening up more and more, but there can often be, in my experience, and people I've worked with or talked to, just insights into the generational trauma you know just an insight that feels very real um you know this is what it was like to be my grandmother this is what it was like when this incident happened um you know and then sometimes you can research and, and find out the biographical pieces in it but to, to really you know experience what it's like to have been other people um you know in, in circumstances throughout history and then you know, begin to, like you say, you know, feel it and heal it and, and release it. Um, there's a man named Christopher Beish, who uh, was a friend and, and a follower of Stan Groff's work. And he wrote a book recently called LSD in the Mind of the Universe. And he worked with, uh, he's an academic, a gifted teacher, uh, retired from teaching now. But he worked with psychedelics over a period of years to try to get insights into how the universe operates in the current moment that we're offered in history. And part of the part of what he offers in his experience is that we are, you know, many of us now are offered the possibility of healing collective trauma. So like you're saying, not not just the individual trauma, although really in a way, I don't think you could ever really fully separate the individual sense of trauma from the collective because you know, the, the reason the trauma gets into me is because of what happened to my parents or what happened to the community or what happened nationally or internationally. So it's all part of the same thing, you know, and that's a real transpersonal concept. And, you know, the, the beauty of working with holotropic states for me is you begin to see the strands, to feel the strands and to feel into them with compassion and love, and then can start to sort of release the, the the stranglehold that they have on the body and the community and um so yeah that's a a dream of mine is to help you know support particularly including supporting younger generations of of healers and and coaches and and therapists and workers to you know join together and, and help you know find ways to to offer um experiences to people that support these these types of healing and awakening and i think it, and, and part of it to state the obvious is we're a global community now you know and so you know it's no longer a meth a, a, an issue of how do i heal my my tribe or even how do i heal my my state or my country but for better or worse we're all in this together and we need to find a way to um to understand and frame healing and moving forward in that way and I do think, and this is, you know, it's it's contrary to mainstream paradigms and it's even contrary to some of the economic power structures, but, you know, the, I think the, 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 the offering is to go within, you know, not relying on expertise, not relying upon power over, not relying on dogma, but each of us individually and then community going within, finding what's there, and then having the support to have the courage and the resilience and the strength to move through what's there. Um, yeah, that takes, uh, <laughs> I mean, again, I like everything you're saying, like resonates so deeply in, in me because there is like healing collective trauma. Like we are all just nodes of consciousness in the universe, yeah. right? So we're all tapped in to get sharing the same collective trauma so we're healing we're 
loosening the knots of the collective consciousness is how I yeah. see it. And, and it is, um, and there is this beautiful piece of embodied, like embodiment seems so important um, in this work. You know, it's like, I, I can cognitively understand that like, I can be healed and I can do these things. But when you have this embodied experience of resolving or integrating, right. you know, deep trauma, it's, it, it, it really, it, that piece helps to build the compassion and to build the, the unconditional love. Yeah. And I feel like that's so, yeah, just really, really important to building what you're talking about this, you know, understanding nature and, and the kind of impact that we as humans are having. It brings up for me, um, awareness of radical responsibility, right? Yeah. That actually, I, I, that the world is not happening to me. Yeah that I am a part of what's happening in the world and I can take whatever responsibility. And I think that takes a lot of courage to say like, wow, like I've, I've fucked up. Like I've made, <laughs> I've made some mistakes yeah. and, and I yeah. can, and I can say, okay, like I, I've noticed this and I'm, and I keep noticing it. I notice it in these patterns. I notice it in other people and when I'm noticing it in them, like how does this live in me and how can I, what can I do? to heal this and also I, I i just want to touch too on i don't know if maybe again another definition yeah. to define sure. would be uh, a holotropic I, I love i love this term so much because wholeness is so much um a part of um you know my healing journey i know every, everyone's healing journey and um maybe you want to just share a little bit about uh the meaning of the term and then also how you're seeing it both in psychedelic and the breath work and, and what that means. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So holotropic. So Stan on um, Groth, when he was uh, initially working with, with LSD in legal settings um, as a psychiatrist and supporting the experience and then finding the best set and setting and practices for people to, to, um, heal and experience personal growth with psychedelics. Um, he realized that, uh, and then later he and, and Christina developed uh, what they called holotropic breathwork as a means to invite similar states of consciousness that um, were invited with psychedelics. So he noticed that there's a healing state of consciousness that um, brings forward what he calls an inner healing intelligence that supports moving, you know, through trauma, for example, but that's just one piece of it. And so, you know, as we were talking, I think a little bit earlier, the mainstream culture just doesn't have a whole lot of words or understandings for these types of um, healing states of consciousness. So he created the word holotropic um, from holos, which is Greek for wholeness and the Greek word trepane, which means moving towards like you, many of us know the word heliotropic when a plant follows the sun. Um, and so moving towards wholeness is the basic idea in Stan's work that if we're supported um, in accessing the deep inner healing intelligence that we all have and that you know, connects to a collective consciousness, the collective unconscious and the collective um, healing, I mean, God or whatever what words you want to use, that that begins a healing process that, that moves forward. So holotropic moving towards wholeness. Um, and you might hear us refer to holotropic breathwork. That's the description Stan used for, for many years for that particular process. In Groff Legacy, we're calling it Groff Legacy. Groff breath work. We're trying to build, um, you know, people's uh, understanding of Stan's work in general. And um, honestly, a lot of people have told us Groff breath work is easier to understand than holotropic. But I appreciate. It. <laughs> but I appreciate. It's a little shorter. It. <laughs> it's a little shorter. But I appreciate uh, the um, the question about hol holotropic, um, and uh, and you know, it's an important part of. Stan's work. And then to get back to something else that, that you said, which I thought was so beautifully said, you know, in working with people in um, 
holotropic states, when they experience something deeply moving, you know, I might suggest to them, well, just try to hold on to that feeling in your body, mm. you know, and then we recommend that people after doing breath work, create what we call a mandala, which is just basically taking a big piece of paper with a circle on it and then paints or crayons or cutouts from magazines to create a representation of the experience that's not linear and not linguistic, but kind of pulls at the heart and somehow um, embodies the experience. Because I think it's, um, it's the, the embodied and emotional memory of these healing experiences that really can last and carry forward. And, you know, they can be easily lost, you know, like, like dream images can kind of fade away. But if we work to, to hold on to those experiences and recreate them, I think that's where the real possibilities for individual and collective transformation um, arise. Mm, I love that. It, it, to me, it's like we're building uh, like, like muscle memory, right? Absolutely. Or like, a, like aware, awareness exactly. memory. Right. And even in dream work, um, often something that I find very grounding and helpful is not just remembering the sequence or the imagery of the dream, but like what did different parts of the dream like make you feel? Like what was that yes. feeling in yeah. the dream that can be really uh, helpful in, in creating understanding or meaning and um, kind of connecting the dots, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I was fortunate to be in a dream group for many years, but it was exactly that finding the feeling that's being offered and then moving into that and understanding it and where does it take us? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Right. There's something you mentioned um, around the spiritual emergency or even I think in the uh, holotropic work is um, supporting yourself and with resources. Um, I'm curious if in the work you've done, you know, what kind of resources uh, have been helpful and maybe if there's someone going through spiritual emergency, you know, where, where, where do you reach out to? I find it very hard, like even in my searches of looking for a therapist for, you know, my own personal development, you know, there are a lot of these databases really um, don't really have even space to share around spirituality. And for, for me personally, I don't yeah. want anyone in my subconscious space unless they yeah. have some kind of connection to spirituality. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I'm curious if, yeah, what resources or recommendations you might have. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, finding community has been important to me and I have been fortunate to find the communities that, that arose around Stan's work, and then certainly with the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, um, you know, and it, it, the the internet is useful, you know, and then I think it also leads to personal conversations. Like I think you found us through Groff Legacy, and then you and I have developed conversations, and you know, you start to feel, hey, this this person, you know, feels safe or feels feels like can can help me grow in a certain way, and then just follow the synchronicities and follow the communities and the directions. There is something online called the Spiritual Emergence Network that um, was originally founded by Stan and Christina Groff and others that still exists. So that has a, a website listed state by state and, and people that um, have asked to be put on the website that offer um, services from um, a transpersonal spiritual perspective that's also psychological and um you know i i'm not in a position to endorse any particular people on there but but that's a way to begin but i think it's so critical to um have the personal interactions you know whether it's a community or you know and then so many people now um you know seeking not only state experiences in, in groups that arise um you know in this country or, or otherwise but just to anyone you're going to work with, make sure you have that sense of safety and trust. Um, and then any, you know, um, yoga groups, meditation groups, um, movement groups, uh, nature groups. I mean, individually, you know, nature has really helped me. Um, I've had horses for many years being with, with horses and animals, being in water, hiking, 
all of these things. Yeah, and I really am hopeful. I mean, if if I have any calling at all, it's to help, um, you know, uh, the growth and the solidification of of groups like this, and then, you know, trying to lay the groundwork so that we can stay as clear and clean as as possible, and in, in a world which, uh, you know, can pull people in so many different directions. I appreciate that. Yeah, community is really really important. And I think sometimes it's hard to find that community that has that same experience. Like I do feel in very much in my life, I've been very fortunate to kind of cultivate my global network, um, yeah. you know, and, and Zoom's been very beneficial to in nurturing those connections. And um, it, it sometimes it's harder to almost find locally you know, the, yeah. the people that you can share these experiences with. So I'm appreciating more and more the networks that are emerging to support and, um, and share in this awakening process. Yeah, I, I it's, um, I mean, I, I rarely use the word pray, but I, I think it's just something to, to pray for in a way that, um, particularly as we navigate the changes with COVID and, and just, socially and politically that, um, you know, to uh, just to hope that that spirit guides communities together and, and allows ways to begin to come together. Because I think coming together physically is important. Um, and I'm hopeful that that's going to become increasingly possible. Um, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, it's funny when you share that, it um, comes alive in me is uh, we are some of our discussions around bringing back in-person gatherings and trainings now that yeah. there's been some subsiding knock on wood with COVID um yeah maybe that it would be great to share um a little bit of you know what what is the work that you're doing now I know I know you from the Groff Legacy Project um I'm not sure and I know you um are also I think a teacher at, at Pacifica is that right well, yeah, thanks for asking. So, I mean, I've earned my living primarily as a lawyer mediator for many years, and I'm segueing into um, working primarily in teaching and then in helping develop Croft Legacy Project USA. So people can find us on, on, on the web, um, just put in Groff Legacy Project USA, and we have a website, and you can join our community and then get updates about courses and offerings. So we will have... Um, certification programs in becoming a, a, a Groff Breathwork facilitator, and then also in um, learning to support people in psychedelics experiences and in um, using Stan Groff's work as a, a, as, a, as a portal and as a base and as a theoretical lens for that. And so, yeah, it's, it's similar to other kinds of startups where we're, uh, you know, developing the infrastructure and, and figuring out how to combine um, online offerings with in-person gatherings, which will start in 22. Um, some in New Mexico, we have one planned in Kansas City and, um, you know, navigating how that's going to work with, with COVID. But I, I do feel the time is upon us where we just need to do the best we can to gather as safely as we can. And, and try to contribute to every, everybody feeling safe, but I just feel it's so important to start coming back together um, in person for experiences. Uh, and so we'll try to try to do that. Yeah, I'm not actually on faculty at Pacifica, but I was invited to uh, teach a course in their public program that we called Sacred Medicine and the Psyche. So it, it was, um, you know, a, a consideration of the psychedelics renaissance, which is upon us, um, looking at the movement towards the lawful clinics with MDMA, and then the growth of psilocybin and the uses there, and then also the, um, the indigenous practices that are coming back um, all over the world, and certainly in North America and, and Europe, ayahuasca in particular, and then the issues that arise when you know, Westerners um, like me, you know, want to participate in indigenous traditions. Are we stealing somebody's spirituality? You know, there's the whole question of um, the West 
imperialism and colonialism stole lands and, and um, cultures and, and decimated people. And now when we're in spiritual need, are we going to take their spiritual traditions too? Oh. I mean, it's, you know, it's just, it's a serious issue to consider. And yet, um, you know, I know, know people, um, indigenous people who, who feel that um, the sacred plants are uh, themselves wanting to help us all globally in a time of need. So yeah, thanks for asking. But in that course, and probably in other courses I hope to be involved in just um, bringing forward all the issues. And as you and I have talked personally, what's really important to me is helping people feel into understanding what's emerging now as more memory than anything new. You know, and, and interestingly, archaeology and um, and people who are doing research now, I, I'm looking at just on my table, the book, The Immortality Key by Brian Murarescu and his thesis is that uh, sacred medicines were used throughout history. He called it the religion with no name. And the, the heart of that is that uh, sacred experience, you know, used to be individual internal experience of God. And then we got into a couple of thousand years with hierarchy and structure and, um, you know, top down and dogma and um, belief over experience, you know, and that's part of our history. But if we can move into the offering now as a memory of our heritage and our birthright and what it's like to be on the planet, you know, what it's like to experience the sacred, you know, in nature and with nature um, and remember you know, who we are and who we can be um, going forward into the, the future. And, um, you know, it doesn't take a, a genius to understand we're at a real turning point um, ecologically and socially and politically. And, you know, I think more of us who can remember what it's possible to be a healthy human living in sync with nature and in sync with spirit, um, the, um, the better chance we have of creating a future uh, that works. I, I, I love, wow, I love that so much. Uh, to experience the sacred, that uh, really rings true in me. And I, yeah. I really appreciate um, your awareness and sharing um, around the use of indigenous um, plant medicine and this kind of cultural appropriation piece and, 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 you know, how are we also evolving and what, how do we, on, how do we both, and I think that this is still like a co-inquiry and I welcome yeah. feedback and comments, um, yeah. you know, how do we hold the sacred and honor the roots of its existence and how do we also continue to support our evolution and awakening because uh, it seems like from my experience and from, um, you know, the experience of, of close people to me, you know, their time with plant medicine really opens the gateway into this deeper connection with nature and ourselves in a way that um, all of humanity and the earth really need. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm open into you know, how, how do we do both? Yeah, absolutely. And obviously we need to hear from people with indigenous lineage and people who have suffered, um, you know, from the oppression historically and now. And I, I don't mean to speak for any of those folks. And I, the best I can do, like you're saying, is just try to always stay open to it, always turns towards it, turns towards those experiences, honor them and, you know, be grateful and then do the best you can in any given moment. Yeah, thanks, Jay. I, oh, you're uh, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like um, I, I will certainly put all of the references to books and websites um, in the show notes. Okay. Uh, for people to find, and um, just want to reiterate again how much I've been enjoying the um, the holotropic breath work in psychedelic integration class that I'm currently in and I very much look forward to the in-person gatherings in right. 2022 
Right. Um, yeah. And would love to share that with our audiences as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Any upcoming uh, events? Yeah, we'll get. We'll probably by the new year have a schedule out that you'll get. And yeah, any any sharing you can do with that is is phenomenal. And then I I am so hopeful to reach out um, to people who don't know this work yet. You know, particularly people in the younger generations. Um, you know, I, in a way, transpersonal has been um, you know a baby boom thing in a lot of ways. And I'm hoping to find you know with the help of people like yourself the the right language and the right audience to at least let people know here's a path that might work for you. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly um, anticipate the show being a, a piece, a piece of that Great. ripple effect. Great. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. great to see you. I'm honored to, that you asked me to, to have the conversation and we'll all just keep going, huh? Yeah. Thanks, Jay. You can find more recordings, classes, and events on mystics-rising.com.